Joel's not. Okay. Right. Oh, okay, good. Okay, everyone, we should call the meeting to order. <laughs> Moorhead City Council, it's uh, 5 31 p.m., uh, Monday, February 11th, 2019. Can we have a roll call, please? Shelly Dahlquist. Here. Sarah Watson Curry. Here. Shelly Carlson. Here. Heidi Durand. Here. Joel Paulson. Deb White. Here. Steve Gertz. Here. Chuck Hendrickson. Here. Mayor Judd. Here. May we please uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Are there any agenda amendments? Yes, Mr. Mayor, there are three, um, or four, excuse me, amendments. Items number 11 and 12 are being requested to take off consent. Item number 8A, there's a new handout that will replace the item that was on the agenda, and we will upload that to the website. They're on, they were on each of your chairs. And number 18, there was a handout to replace the one that was attached to the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with those amendments as stated by Madam Volkerts? So moved. Okay. Motion made by Council Member Hendrickson, seconded by Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Move to number five, uh, recognitions, presentations. Mr. Mayor, that will be Steve Moore and Paul Feekner, um, who Paul's our facilities manager and Steve's our public works director, I believe, are presenting. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, a little while back we were asked to come in and talk about our facilities and condition assessment and uh, give an update on what uh, that program was. Back in 2016, in December of 2016, we had a contractor come in and review all of our facilities and establish a condition assessment and give them ratings. And Paul is going to brief that and then we're also going to run through our proposed, our 2019 facility improvement uh, capital improvement program for your review and uh, answer any questions and talk about some other items when, uh, regarding facilities. So with that said, I'll just uh, introduce Paul Feekner, our facilities and fleet manager. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, as Steve said, I'll be reviewing the facilities that we have and the condition they're in and talk about what our plan is here in the future to address some of the items. A quick overview of the presentation here, uh, like, we talk, like Steve talked about, is the facility condition assessment. And basically that study with the contractors developed a database where we house all of our facility information. We'll talk about the uh, current conditions of the facilities and then I would like to review the process that we used for selecting facility projects, talk about the 2019 capital improvement plan and then a little discussion on the future planning and vision for our facilities. So as Steve said, uh, inspections were completed in December of 2016. 
where contractors came in and reviewed our facilities and the condition they were in. They de developed a database, which is called Builder, and much of what that database works off is each asset is assigned a condition index rating. The condition index is based on the asset service life and then also the inspection data. And one thing to remember with the database is it is a, a living constantly changing based on what information we put into it or what we want from it. Um, so it is something we can continue to use um, as we manage our facilities. So the condition index is, as I said earlier, calculated based on the asset age and the inspection and it gives it a number. Basically 85 to 100 is green, uh, the condition's in good condition. 84 to 70, it's amber, which is where we would start seeing maybe some maintenance costs go up, but relatively serviceable. And then when it's 69 or below, we would see a, it's estimated that we would see a higher amount of maintenance costs for that item, and we should consider or at least review replacement or repair. Uh, another example here is kind of how that, the computer graphs it out. This is the the boiler here in City Hall and kind of as time goes by it shows how the the condition index of the the asset goes down. And then uh, what you can also do with the system is summarize the facility as a whole. So this is just a snapshot of City Hall and it has the various systems, the electrical, HVAC, plumbing, and it assigns a condition to each of those uh, systems within the facility itself. So with that information, uh, we can talk about the current condition of our facilities. Um, just as, and as, as an example, we'll start with City Hall here with some of the information that's stored in the database. Um, built in 1971, 37,500 square feet. Estimates the replacement cost of the building at roughly 10 million. And then um, the last item is the sum of the red rated work items. And what that is is that's all of the assets in City Hall that have reached that 69 or lower rating. And that's the column red rated at that point. So the building as a whole, uh, when you take a look at all of the conditions of all the systems, it rates it at 67. And here it gives a more detailed breakout of each system within the facility and uh, what that condition is at. Next slide here, what I did is took the facilities and just graphed them out where the overall facility condition is rated and put them on the graph there. You can see the ones that are red, the ones that are amber, and the ones that are green. Um, as far as this presentation here, I just wanted to show you guys City Hall, but I can go into any of these facilities if you have any questions or anything you want to dig into deeper. Also included in the um, facility condition assessment is the neighborhood recreational centers. So they're all on this slide also showing their condition um, and how they are rated. So earlier I mentioned the red rated items, basically all of the assets that have fallen below that, uh, into that red area. What this slide shows is each facility and the tabulated cost for replacing the assets that are in the red. If you take a look at the full total for the, sale for the city is 4.6 million. Um, when we talk about planning and looking to at our facilities in the future, there's a few that we can take off the list here. The sports center, which is being transferred to the school district here in July. The transfer station, which we have plans in place to build a new facility uh, partnered with Clay County. And then also Usher's House, which is the uh, American Legion building. If we take those totals off of the list, it brings us down to 3.4 million as far as red rated items. And this would be currently in 2019 as far as all of the items this year or prior. 
Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Paul, did you take off the sports center you said? Yes. Okay. Because we're selling it to the school district. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Or sold it to. Okay. Thanks. So another thing the database allows us to do or all of the facility data is project what our costs will be in the future. So that's what this graph shows here in 2019. It's showing everything prior to 2019, including 2019. Um, when we move into 2020, there'll be another $500,000 worth of items. And then in 2021, you'll see a, a small spike there, or a spike of 2.2 million. And it just gives us a chance to project it out and see uh, what the needs are of the facilities in the future. So moving on to that, uh, as you guys know, we don't have $3.4 million to, to work on our facilities in our 2019 budget. So I'll review our capital plan. Some of the factors that I put into play when determining the priority of which projects we're actually going to do out of this $3.4 million is first safety. Um, if it's something that impacts the safety of employees or cities uh, or citizens of the city, obviously want to make sure that's addressed right away. The impact to service. If something were to go down that would impact uh, city employees and their ability to do their job or perform their service. And then also the individual building priority and the impact it has on the budget. So I won't bore you with the flow chart here, but there is a process uh, starting with the data database uh, with the facility information. From that, uh, it took time to validate the condition of those items and then also prioritize them. The next step was to sit down and meet with the building users, so the main person for each facility, making sure that their goals and what they see with their facility is in line with what we have from the database and what's in the plan there. From there, wanted to make sure it's in line with our 20-year plan, which I'll talk about later, and then the 2019 capital plan was briefed with the city manager and the executive leadership team to make sure all departments are in line with what we're doing and where we're spending our funds. Furthermore, the, what we're doing now is briefing with city council on what the plan is and from there we will finalize the plan and start executing projects and then it just goes full circle there um, once we have the capital plan, it can be fed into the budget for future years, and then that what feedback we get from the budget goes back into what we can accomplish uh, for future projects. Quick snapshot of the 2018 capital improvement projects. This is what was done here in 2018, uh, totaling 1.2 million on the facilities. This came from various um, revenue streams or not revenue, excuse me, budget streams. And then the next slide here is the 2019 project. So after we went, after I went through the whole process there, came up with 23 um, capital improvement projects for 2019 to execute. Yeah. Mr. My apologies, uh, Mr. Fickner. So these are projects that have already been budgeted for, like these will be worked on? Yes, okay. the, the 2019 budget is for 700000 for capital improvements, and then uh, these are the projects that were selected to, to do with those funds. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yep. And I won't go through all of these one by one, um, but if you do see any you want to discuss further or get some more detail on, I can do that. Mayor Judd, if I could ask a question. Could, My apologies. Yes, could we just go back to the 2018? I just was curious about the library project. So it said for the Public Library Repair Foundation basement leak, and um, with that one it just says monitor condition. So does that mean it hasn't been repaired and we're just... So there, yes. there's a crack in the foundation that okay. was having water come in, and there was a, a minor repair done to it. Okay. And we've just been monitoring it. We haven't seen any further issues with water okay. coming through. So it hasn't completely been closed out because we're not 100% confident, um, but 
once we go through this spring and we don't have any further issues. Okay, we'll it so it's budgeted if we were to repair it, $35,000, but right now we're just sort of waiting to see if we need to spend that money or if we can postpone it? Correct. Okay. I'm sorry, Councilmember. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I noticed for the pool, um, kind of skipped ahead a little bit. We have electrical at a 44 for building condition. What's going on with that? And it's not up in the 2019 projects, but I did skip ahead and it's <coughs> electrical's at 44. Is, wouldn't that be like a top priority? Which one are you at? I'm sorry. I'm on page. What's in the agenda? I think it's page 48. But it's it's got a, it's got a list of every um, facility, and it's facility summary for the municipal pool. And the building condition and index is at 67, and then there's electrical at a 44. I'm kind of wondering, or am I not correlating those together correctly? Oh, okay. Yeah. So the the computer rated the electrical system at 44. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep, and going back to where the computer gets that, that's, a lot of that's based on age itself. Um, so are you asking why we're not doing anything? Yeah, I mean, what's the condition of it right now? And, and I understand the age thing, but what's the condition of it right now? Look. Right now right now it's functioning. Okay. Um, I don't have any specifics on, on exactly any defects or anything, but the reason it would be rated at that would be primarily because of the age. Okay, but has there any, been any problems with it in the past? No, not that I'm aware of. Right okay. now, there haven't been any issues with the electric. I just, I just think water and electricity, and <laughs> you know, it's okay. Yeah, Thank you. definitely. Mayor Judd, I wanted to go back to the neighborhood recreation centers. So, mm -hmm. and I, and I do appreciate that. Um, when we when we're prioritizing projects that you know things like fire safety is is you know um, is very important. But I just overall when I looked at that, I was just surprised that for our neighborhood recreation centers that all but three of them are red rated. And so where do we uh, has there been discussion of that, or how do we compare to other communities? And I, and I understand when funds are limited that that may not make it up the list in terms of priorities, but it was surprising to me just to see how few of our recreation centers um, were not red rated. Yeah, definitely, and that's something we addressed, or one thing I'm looking at right now. Eight of the recreational centers were built in 1989, and they're all of the same vintage. Mm -hmm. And that's something in the 2019 plan, it would be uh, number 14, yeah. is that's right. what I'd like to look into is what we can do to renovate a lot of them. Um, a replacement of that facility is estimated in the 200 to 300,000. Um, but what I'm wanting to do is take a look at them, and specifically the ones that were built in the 80s have a lot of similar issues with them. So packaging a renovation where we can renovate one or two a year and, and get them back up to a, a green health and keep them serviceable. Um, so you. definitely that's in the plan. Council Member Gertz. Yeah, and I, I'm presuming the reason why a lot of them fell below that 70 rating is because a lot of it has to do with the age. So they're just like right on the border where just this little bit of renovation probably put them in into the next category. And so I, I think what you're doing is a good good plan. Okay. Ms. Wilkers. Mr. Mayor, Paul. Um, I want to remind the council that last year you passed a policy that if we sell any um, buildings that are city owned, that 75% of the sales price would go back towards these red rated items. So while we don't have $3.4 million for the really urgent ones, we did just sell um, the former Usher's house and that 75% of that sale price will go in to assist with this and get us further down the list. So I'm not sure if the whole council knew that. So. Thank you for that clarification. I, I was not aware of that, so thank you. Mr. 
Any other questions for Mr. Fickner? Okay. I'll, I'll move on here real quick. The last part of the presentation is just discussion on future planning. Uh, another thing I'll be working on here is the five-year plan, so kind of repeating the process and coming up with projection on what we can accomplish in the next five years and getting those projects in order and in priority so that we can address them, work them into the plan, and uh, tackle them with what's suitable. And one other item, uh, we're calling a facility task force, which was, hasn't completely been scoped out uh, yet here, but what I'd like to do is put together a group of people, and that would include city manager and someone from the council definitely to take a look and put together a 20-year outlook on what we want to do with our facilities and essentially provide guidance uh, on the future so that we can scope our facility projects accordingly. Um, you know, an example there is if we are utilizing a facility, we wouldn't want to do a multi-million dollar renovation to find out two or three years later we're leaving that facility, right? So that's where we need the, I guess, the vision and the, the long-term scope on how to address the facilities so we can keep them in good condition but then also spend our money wisely. That's all. Any uh, other uh, questions for Mr. Fickner? Well, thank you for okay. the report. It uh, really clears up a lot, um, I know for myself, uh, and breaking it down the way that you had to make it really user-friendly for me, uh, for sure, because uh, that really gives us a pretty good vision of what you're looking at. So I really appreciate your hard work in that. Thank you, too, Mr. Okay. Moore. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I believe there is a public hearing. So the public hearing. So the Mr. Mayor, um, legal advises that we do do the um, citizens addressing the council first. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. Sorry. Are there any uh, citizens uh, that wish to address the council that are present currently? Okay. Seeing none, then we'll move to the public hearing. And this is public hearing. It's on the agenda number nine, public hearing to consider wastewater treatment facility plan. And then there's some language after that in parentheses that I'm not sure. Madam Volkers, if you can help me out with. That's, that's our engineering number. So every project that we do, we assign <laughs> a number to that. Engineers. <laughs> There's a specific code that we, uh, a secret code that we use. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll restate uh, with, uh, Ms. with Dr. Zimmerman's uh, now breakdown. So it's a public hearing to consider wastewater treatment facility plan engineering number 18-06-04. So now the item is introduced. Can I get a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Motion to open the public hearing uh, made by Council Member Duran, seconded by uh, Council Member Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. We are now in open hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members. Jill, can we put that in presentation mode? Thanks. Uh, as, as noted, uh, the uh, tonight's hearing is to uh, essentially receive public comment on a draft wastewater facility plan. Uh, this plan identifies a number of short-term improvements for the uh, sanitary collection system as well as the wastewater treatment facility. And at the conclusion of the hearing, there's a draft resolution in the council packet to, to, for your consideration to adopt that facility plan. This <coughs> hearing also satisfies a procedural requirement for one of the proposed financing tools that we'll talk about a little bit later. So this hearing essentially is a uh, continuation of some previous uh, discussions that uh, the city council has had uh, back in August of 2017 
We talked about some ongoing permit negotiations with, with relation to total phosphorus limits uh, for the wastewater plant. I suspect you'll be hearing more about that in the relatively near future. We've had some contact with the, uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency or MPCA about that issue. Uh, and we have an upcoming meeting sometime in the next month or two. Also talked about um, asset management needs for the, uh, the wastewater facility. Most recently on December 10th, uh, we had a preview of tonight's public hearing talking about some interim improvements uh, that, are, that are being recommended as a result of this process. I believe uh, most everyone was in attendance at that meeting whether it be as a council member or as a member of the audience at that time. So as a result of those previous discussions, uh, we embarked upon a long-term planning process for the wastewater facility that really involved uh, two phases. The first one to look at the existing design of the facility, what the capacity is, look at 20-year uh, growth projections, uh, as well as uh, condition assessment of all of the various processes uh, moving into phase two where we would look at necessary long-term process equipment improvements uh, and specifically look at four other issues phosphorus biosolids disinfection and energy we won't focus on those now we'll save that for a future date the idea being this would lead to a long-term 20-year plan for the wastewater plant along the way a number of short-term uh, more immediate needs were identified, uh, three of those at the wastewater facility and two of those in the collection system, and that's really the subject of tonight's hearing. We'll talk a lot more about those in detail, which is leading us to the facility plan being considered tonight, which is what we would consider more of an interim plan. It doesn't include the long-term 20-year projections. That effort will still continue on its own. This table is a summary of the uh, proposed improvements included in the facility plan. Since we're going to talk about each one of these individually, I won't go through this table in detail. I would just note that the facility planning process uh, requires that we talk about the need for the improvements tonight as well as the alternatives considered. And unfortunately, to do that, we have to get a bit technical. So I'll ask that you bear with me, and I'll try to avoid getting excessively technical on each of these issues. Uh, the first proposed improvement is at the wastewater facility, and maybe just a couple of comments about the facility in general, what happens there. So wastewater is collected from throughout the city and is pumped to the wastewater plant. Uh, there are a number of treatment processes at the plant that remove contaminants from the wastewater uh, to a point where it can be returned or discharged back to the Red River. That's governed by a permit issued by the MPCA, and there's some pretty stringent requirements on the quality of the water that goes back to the river. So think of this plant as a series of unit processes that treat that wastewater. The very first process uh, at the plant is uh, our bar screens. Fairly simple physical process. Uh, these are intended to remove large solids, uh, rags, flushable wipes, things that can damage down tr downstream equipment and processes. Uh, the, these bar screens, uh, the, the bar screens in existence at the plant today were installed in 1994. Uh, they, they're not uh, capable of handling the, uh, the volumes of flow uh, that we regularly see. So we see surcharging of the channels that lead up to these bar screens. Uh, the, the spacing between the bars is relatively large, three quarters of an inch, which allows material to pass through. Ideally, we'd like to see those be closer together on the order of a quarter of an inch. Uh, and they're essentially beyond their useful life. So we're looking at replacing these, uh, these pieces of equipment. There are two of them uh, at the plant. I would just note that for any of this equipment, uh, the uh, atmospheres and conditions that they operate under are relatively harsh in terms of corrosion potential. Typically for equipment, we think of uh, useful life on the order of 15 to 20 years. 
So for uh, this piece of equipment, the, we looked at four different alternatives. Uh, they're listed there, and the format for all of the, uh, the improvements proposed tonight is we'll show you the alternatives, and the, the blue text identifies the, uh, the recommended alternative. Certainly, if we want to talk about these alternatives in detail, we'll, we can do that. I'm assuming maybe not. And so we'll just jump right to the recommendation here is to replace the existing screens with uh, what are called step screens. These screens are capable of handling uh, much larger flows. Uh, these screens would also have closer spacing, uh, so we'd get better uh, removal. And one of the primary driving factors behind selection of this type of screen is that we can accomplish it without structural modifications. There are a few, a couple of other pieces of equipment that are uh, really ancillary to the bar screens. There's a, a belt conveyor that's beyond its useful life. We looked at alternatives for that, and what we're proposing here is a screening washing press that uh, will essentially wash the material that's been removed from the screens, reduce the volume, as well as the weight. That material all is shipped to the landfill. And then lastly, a piece of equipment called the grit classifier. Uh, and this is essentially just a replacement of uh, an existing piece of equipment in kind but with stainless steel. The uh, total cost for these improvements is estimated to be just about $1.6 million. The second uh, improvement proposed at the wastewater plant involves what's called the digester cover. So as I'd mentioned, there's a number of processes at the plant to remove contaminants. Essentially what happens is those contaminants are, are reduced down to a smaller volume of solids that require further treatment that then can be land applied on farm fields for the nutrient value. Uh, anaerobic digesters are the treatment process that prepares those solids for beneficial reuse for fertilizer value. So what we do is we take those solids, put them in these tanks called anaerobic digesters, and what you see here is actually the cover itself, not the full tank, uh, and heat and mix essentially cook this stuff for about 15 days. In that process, we generate a gas, which is about 60% methane. We're able to beneficially reuse that gas by burning it in boilers at the plant, uh, and use that for heating the building as well as that process. So in this cover, we, we store that, that methane gas for reuse. It's a flexible membrane cover. Uh, it is uh, experiencing some challenges. Uh, you'll note that we've applied a large number of patches uh, just within the last couple of years, and so we need to uh, replace that cover. The, the risk here is that if we're not able to beneficially reuse the digester gas that's produced, we'll have to purchase natural gas, and the cost of doing that is about $200,000 per year. So in order to replace that cover, the alternatives considered here were a steel cover versus a replacing the, the cover with a flexible membrane, essentially a replacement in kind. Um, flexible membrane is by far preferred, uh, would not require structural modifications to the tank. Uh, it has a much larger storage capacity, so essentially a replacement in kind. Estimated cost for that is about 675000 And then lastly, uh, we maintain a fleet of uh, emergency equipment, uh, generators, pumps, as well as some other uh, equipment uh, that we have uh, ready for rapid deployment in the cases uh, in case of emergencies uh, for example power outages floods intense rain events and so on uh, previously uh, a fair amount of this equipment was stored in a building on the site of the Cullen hockey arena uh, that building was demolished with the hockey arena expansion uh, we moved the equipment from there and are temporarily storing it in a buyout property for the North Moorhead Flood Mitigation Project. 
Uh, but that building is scheduled for demolition later this year. So we need to find a home for uh, all of this emergency equipment. So the uh, proposal is to construct a storage building uh, on the wastewater facility site. Uh, in terms of alternatives, uh, masonry versus pre-engineered, the wastewater facility itself, constructed back in the 1980s, is, is primarily uh, uh, masonry or brick. Um, but we do have uh, one building on site that's pre-engineered, and for this purpose, pre-engineered is uh, perfectly satisfactory. So the recommended uh, improvement here is a pre-engineered structure, uh, estimated cost of about $1.3 million. Putting that on the site of the wastewater plant will allow us to tie into the, uh, the heating system that exists on site, which has capacity to do that. Uh, this building that we're proposing would be minimal, minimally heated, uh, but being able to tie into that existing heating system allows us to uh, maximize the use of the digester gas or methane gas that we produce on site uh, to heat that facility. In terms of location, this is something that, again, the facility planning requirements uh, govern um, our discussion tonight. We have to identify for the public where these improvements are located. Uh, all of the three that we just talked about would be located on site at the wastewater treatment facility. The next two improvements are in the collection system and maybe just to deviate for a second to talk about the collection system we're sort of doing this in reverse order but so as wastewater leaves your home or your business flows flows through a building service out to the street where we have a uh, city sewer main uh, most streets in town have sewer mains under them not all it's just a network of pipes that collect the wastewater they're all installed at a slope and so the wastewater flows by gravity uh, at some point the pipe gets too deep, it's uneconomical, and so we install a pump station or what we call a lift station to raise that back up and then allow it to flow by gravity again. The exception being uh, there's no gravity flow to the wastewater plant. All of the flow to the plant is pumped from one of four pump stations or lift stations. There are about 40, a little over 40 sanitary lift stations scattered throughout the city, which is a very large number for, for a town of our population, but that totally relates to geography, right? It's so flat. So the next improvement is at one of those uh, sanitary lift stations, happens to be what we call number 14. This lift station is located in the Regal Estates manufa Manufactured Home Park. Uh, it's one of our older lift stations, constructed originally in 1966. The map uh, shows the service area, it's a little bit small. But you see the red network of pipes. Those are all pipes uh, that lead, ultimately lead to this lift station. Again, roughly about a third of the city. And this is one of those uh, four large uh, pump stations that pumps directly to the, to the wastewater facility. So a failure at this lift station would affect a large number of properties. Again, constructed in 1966, uh, the existing structure is really too small to house properly sized pumps and various equipment. Uh, the structure itself is beyond its useful life. Generally, we would put 50 years uh, life on a structure for uh, any kind of wastewater application. Uh, in addition, there's an, there's an area of undeveloped property to the north. It's shown in the black box on that map. Uh, we anticipate sometime in the future that property will develop as our system is currently configured we would have to add another lift station to service that area, whereas we may, with this project, have the ability to service that uh, without the addition of a new lift station. So the alternatives that we considered here were to upgrade the station in its existing location, to replace the station or, or relocate and reconstruct the station to the north, or replace uh, um, to the south, I'm sorry, and or replace uh, the station with the new station to the north. We spent a little bit more time on this one. The cost estimates for all three are shown here. And you'll note that the recommended improvement, new, new lift station to the north, is not the lowest cost alternative. There are several reasons for that. 
which we'll get into uh, a little bit more in the next couple of slides. These next three slides are just layouts for the, uh, the three locations that were considered uh, as part of the alternative. So this is the existing site. It's a little bit north of 6th Avenue, and I, I believe the street you see is, uh, is Lancaster, if I remember correctly. But this is right within the manufactured home park. So this is reconstruction on the existing site. The red boxes rep represent the lift station structure. The red lines and the green lines represent sanitary pipes or sanitary sewers. You'll note this, this uh, location uh, is very, very close to the uh, county ditch, and it is also very close to existing homes within the park. I think the closest home is uh, approximately 20 feet away. So that was alternative one. The next alternative was to reconstruct to the south. So the street that you see on the south that curves down is 6th Avenue North. Uh, the red box, boxes again show the proposed location for the new structure. This happens to be right next to the office for the manufactured home park and actually is on the site of a park uh, for children to play. Um, so there's some obvious negatives to, to relocating in that location. It's also not a very big site. Uh, in terms of space needed for the structure. The other alternative, that being to the north, so this is just to the south of 8th Avenue North. That's the street along the north edge. Um, there's a stormwater pond at this location that we would have to, to slightly modify and move, but this location is by far the best for a number of reasons, uh, which are really summarized in this slide. So consider this to be in some regard, non-monetary uh, considerations. Comparing the two lowest cost alternatives, so a comparison of the lowest cost alternative, which was upgrading the existing, existing station uh, versus what's recommended, the new station to the north. Um, for the new station to the north, a recommended alternative, we own the property as opposed to having to acquire additional property uh, if we were to upgrade existing. Access to the, the north site would be off public streets versus uh, access off private streets. Uh, the north location would enhance or increase the buffer between the, the lift station and uh, private property. Uh, and we can also provide service to that undeveloped property that I previously noted without the addition of a new or a, an additional lift station. And then lastly, I think the most important thing is that the existing station can remain in operation throughout most of the construction. Uh, if we try to reconstruct the existing station on site, we're going to have to do what we call bypass pumping, bring in temporary pumping and pump large volumes of wastewater temporarily around the construction site. Pretty challenging, pretty risky operation. So as a result, our recommendation here is to relocate that lift station to the north. And the last recommended improvement here involves uh, rehabilitation of some brick sewers. Uh, so we have, uh, in the downtown area, approximately 7,000 feet of brick sewer that was installed by hand uh, back in the 1940s, which uh, has actually performed very well considering it's 70 years old. We've kept a pretty close eye on this uh, sewer over the years. and. We did have an issue uh, last fall uh, with one of these that uh, led us to look at this a little bit closer. Uh, and we strongly believe that we should embark upon a process to proactively rehabilitate these sewers. Uh, they service a large area of the city. We'll, I'll show you a map of the approximate service area. Uh, they've, they've lived their useful life, and we have an opportunity here to proactively uh, rehabilitate those. So really two alternatives considered here. One, just complete replacement. In other words, dig up the entire length of pipe, uh, dig up the, remove the street, dig up the pipe, replace the pipe with uh, new pipe and restore the street. Obviously very disruptive as well as very expensive. You'll note in the table on the bottom left, cost estimate to, uh, to do that is a little over $23 million. The second alternative is to use what's called trenchless lining. 
So what we do here is, is work with a, a supplier to manufacture a liner that can be pulled into the brick pipe and then cured in place. So it's sometimes called cured in place pipe. Um, because of the size of these sewers, these are relatively large sewers, um, we would need to excavate, but not the entire street, just at the manholes. We'll have to get access to the pipe itself, so it would require excavation uh, at the manholes. Cost to, uh, to, to uh, use trenchless lining for these pipes is uh, about just under $13 million. I, I do need to note here, though, that our ability to line every segment of pipe that we have, that's brick sewer, will be determined in final design. We're assuming that the condition is such that a liner will be functional, and we won't know that till we get into uh, final design. Because of the size of this project, the magnitude of this project, we're proposing that this be done over a period of four years. Uh, a little hard to see on the screen here, but this map is also provided separately in the city council packet. The blue lines here represent where those brick sewers are located. The point being, these are in the heart of the downtown area. And the service area, so um, the, the red lines uh, in this map represent, for the most part, there's a little bit of this area that, that is, let me back up. This is the service area for sanitary lift station number one, which is approximately the same as the service area for these brick sewers. The red lines represent properties that flow directly to the brick sewers ultimately, and the blue lines are properties or, or pipes that are pumped or indirectly served by that. So the point is, there's a long way to get there, but the point is a failure of these brick sewers can have a significant effect on a large number of properties throughout the city. So this is a summary of all five of those projects along with the estimated cost by no means insignificant. I do want to note that tonight's potential action, uh, adopting the facility plan, does not authorize construction of any of this. This is simply adopting the plan to proceed forward. All of these projects would be subject to development of detailed plans and specifications. All of these projects would be competitively bid. So the obvious question is, how would we pay for these improvements? So all of these improvements would be financed through the Wastewater Treatment Fund, which is an enterprise fund supported almost entirely by customer service charges. A project of this magnitude is well beyond the annual budget. The annual budget for that fund is in the range of nine to $10 million. Uh, so we'll need to seek some sort of financing in the first and in staff's opinion, best option for this is to seek a water pollution control revolving fund loan. This is a, a, pro, a statewide program administered by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency as well as the Public Facilities Authority. So as a loan, we would need to repay that loan. The debt service uh, would be paid through service charge revenue. The benefit of this program is that the interest rates, this is specifically focused to wastewater and stormwater projects. So the interest rate uh, here is below market rate. It's a subsidized interest rate, typically about 1.5% below um, interest rates for bonds. So that's a benefit. Uh, somewhat negative side of that is because it's a government program, there's more red tape, right? We have more procedural requirements to go through, such as this facility plan process. The next step in the process is requesting placement on what's called the intended use plan. At some point uh, later this year, uh, the state determines how many projects it can fund from cities all across the state uh, and draws a line. Those above the line get funded, those below don't get funded. We believe we uh, have a good chance of being in the fundable range when that uh, list is issued. So this is uh, one option, and this is the option that we would recommend that the, uh, the city pursue to finance these improvements. Obviously, many more steps would need to come before the city council before that was all in place. 
The other, another option, I should say another option would be to forego that loan process and just seek a, uh, or issue a general obligation revenue bond. So again, bond loan. This bond, uh, debt service would be also paid through uh, service charge revenue. Um, the benefit of this option is there are fewer administrative requirements. The downside is the interest rate doesn't get subsidized and therefore the interest rate is, is uh, slightly higher. The last option which really isn't feasible for, for this project would be to use reserves. Our wastewater treatment fund has reserves on roughly the order of magnitude of $5 million or 5 to $6 million, not sufficient to fund the whole project. But what we can do, what we're proposing to do is use the reserve fund to transition or use incremental rate increases over a period of years rather than a one-time big rate increase. So the next several slides, and we can go through these fairly quickly, I'll just explain this first one in more detail, and then we'll just jump through the next several are some scenarios of um, customer rate impacts or rate adjustments that would be required to fund, uh, to fund this, the entire $19 million project. Uh, all of these assume a water pollution control revolving fund loan at an assumed interest rate of 2.9% uh, re repaid over a period of 20 years. So what's shown here in the bars are the uh, the wastewater treatment fund reserves, and the scale for that is off to the left in millions of dollars. What's uh, shown on the blue line are rate increases in percent. The scale in percent is off on the right side. The numbers that are tagged, <clears throat> excuse me, to the blue line represent the monthly increase in the average residential service charge. And for reference, our current average residential service charge is about $30 per month. So if you look at those numbers, that would be added on to, the, to that $30 per month. And then lastly, the, the green line represents uh, the minimum target reserve balance in this fund by city code for enterprise funds. That's 25% of the annual budget. So assuming roughly a $10 million budget, that line is shown at two and a half million across all of these different graphs. So what you see going on here is we're proposing various rate adjustments uh, to soften this a bit and not have a huge rate increase with one in one or two years. We're using reserves to, to, uh, to buffer that, uh, stay above the minimum recommended reserve and then ultimately build reserves back up to uh, essentially where they're at now over roughly a 10-year period of time. So this particular option, option one, includes 5% rate increases in 2020 through 23, 3% in 24 through 26, and then 2% thereafter. Another option, and these next two options sort of front load the rate increases a little bit. Uh, this one shows 6% uh, in 2020, 5% in 21 and 22, 4% in 23, 3% in 24 and 25, and 2% 26 through 28. And a third option, even a little bit more front-loaded, uh, is shown in option three. 7% in 2020, 4% 21 through 24, 3% in 25, and then 2% thereafter. A last option, which looks very different than the previous three options, would be to introduce another tool to provide funding other than customer charges. Historically, we have funded all rehab of the sanitary collection system and the wastewater facility through user charges. We have not used special assessments. All of those improvements could be funded through special assessments. For example, uh, if we funded the brick sewer rehab through special assessments, the rate increases uh, that would be needed for the balance of the improvements are shown here. I would note that some of our neighbors to the west do use special assessments for projects like sewer rehab, 
we're not recommending that necessarily, but we wanted to make sure that all of those alternatives were available to the council <laughs> for consideration. So what this scenario would involve uh, would be much lower rate increases. So you'll note here 3% through 2023 and then dropping to 2%. But we would then have to levy a special assessment to the benefiting area. Again, if you think back to the map for the service area for the brick sewer, very large. A very, very preliminary estimate would be about 9,000 properties. And if we divided that equally amongst the properties, the cost of the brick sewer improvements amongst those properties, it would be an assessment of about $1,400. Again, not something that we're necessarily recommending, but there are trade-offs between rate increases versus special assessments. And I think an opportunity to contrast how we have historically done things, paying for these improvements all through rates as opposed to some of our neighbors who have lower rates that do use special assessments uh, for those improvements. This table is just a summary of what was in those graphs in terms of project, projected uh, excuse me, rate increases. Council does not need to make a decision tonight on how to proceed, but we felt it was very important that you understand the magnitude of what we're talking about in terms of cost and what the impact might be. We do need to include a scenario within the facility plan, but that's not a commitment to that scenario. So what we will do is we'll use option one in the facility plan unless the council has a strong opinion about some other option and we can, we'll have further discussions as we uh, move forward with these projects about how to implement that. I would say from an engineering staff perspective, we would probably lean closer to option two or three, front load a little bit of this rate increase because there are some unknowns moving forward, especially with some of that brick sewer rehab and exactly how that can be accomplished. We can also develop other scenarios. There's a multitude of scenarios that we could look at. Lastly, uh, proposed schedule. So uh, we're on the second line um, facility, or actually the first line, the public hearing for this facility plan. The second step would be to submit that facility plan by March 1st, which we will do after tonight's uh, hearing. We would recommend that we begin final design on all of these improvements almost immediately. We do have some funds within the wastewater budget this year to do that, probably not enough to complete all of the design, but at least to get, uh, to get that underway. Uh, the loan process is dependent upon the state. We would apply for uh, to be uh, placed on the intended use plan. That intended use plan is uh, issued sometime mid to late summer. So we would not know eligibility of loan funding until sometime uh, late summer. Assuming we were eligible, this is a very optimistic schedule, we could uh, be in a position to move forward with some of this work this fall. Again, this is an optimistic, maybe even aggressive schedule, but that's, that's how we would recommend proceeding. So with that, that's all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I just want to note a couple staff members here, uh, Andy Bradshaw, Tom Sopp, who are really our lead lead guys at the on, at the wastewater plant and for the collection system? A lot of work on this, as well as a couple of consultants are in the room as that have been helping us. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. I think uh, Councilmember Dahlquist has some questions for you. Yes, thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, the storage for 1.3 million mm -hmm. seems like a lot of money it for. It does. A storage place? It does. Um, do you have any, like, reasons for why? We've had one? some pretty lengthy discussions about that. And certainly as we get into a final design, we'll look very closely at that. I think the option here is the most economical option. And so it's really about looking at that as we move into final design. I don't want to say that all of these estimates are high. Certainly, I hope they are. But if I say they're high and we come back to you with a higher number yet, that does not look good for Bob. So what I can tell you is we will look very closely at that as we do the final design. Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Bob, you submit a facility plan to the MPCA. What does the MPCA look for? 
they've they've got a checklist the number of requirements that we have to have looked at alternatives we have to have established the need and several other boxes that they need to check to approve the plan so it's it's procedural mostly is it um, does everybody pass or does every city pass or is there eventually eventually uh, typically what would happen with a facility plan is if they weren't able to check a box they would tell us what was wrong with it and we can correct it until we get to a point where we have a facility plan that can be approved i think maybe the issue that you're leading up to is do we get the money or not it's not really about the facility plan it's really about how much money the state has available okay. and that's the intended use plan process that the public facilities authority determines so what they do is they take they they have a system where they assign points to each of the projects based on different criteria and we think we're going to come out pretty well here especially because the bulk of this cost is for the brick sewer rehab which is 70 years old and should score relatively high in their process but we'll we'll see how that all plays out midsummer thank you great question though council member white Thank you, Mayor Judd. I have two questions, Dr. Zimmerman. So the first one is if you could just talk a little bit more looking at the cost of the um, brick sewer rehabilitation. So I know that's a big ticket item, but I know from conversations with you that you've talked about um, how much more expensive it is if we don't do something and things start to fail. And if you could just share a little information, and we've seen that with the failure that we had on Maine, right? Yeah, emergency work. It so uh, if we have a, a failure of a brick sewer and the challenge with these brick sewers i originally would have characterized this sort of as a domino effect but somebody else characterized it more of a zipper effect once the bricks start failing and you actually excavate to try to replace part of it they just all start collapsing so essentially what could happen is you could have an entire block of sewer fail and have to do an emergency repair now we were fortunate with the one that we did experience in that it was in the fall and the conditions were favorable to actually do work you can imagine if we had a brick sewer failure last week or the week before under those kinds of conditions emergency re repair would be extremely costly so doing this proactively is really important in my oh can i just have my second question oh, so sorry, thanks sure. yeah my second question <laughs> looking at just you mentioned the possibility of special assessment and so um just comparing the what it would cost for the um, individual rate payers if we did say option three compared to what it would cost for those nine thousand households i just looking at option three just doing the math really quickly over 10 years it looks to me like that each, um, uh, you know, uh, each person would pay about $144 um, over the course of those 10 years, whereas if we do it through special assessment, those 9,000 people would pay 1,400, so 10 times more. For the, and these are the same people, many of the same households that have already um, are paying the special assessment for the 2021 underpass and potentially for the 11th Street underpass. So I just want to get that on the record. Absolutely. So, thanks. Who was first? Okay. Councilmember Member Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, two questions. For the MPCA, do they ever partially fund anything? Like if you submit the plan, would they say it's either all or nothing, or would they say we'll do the brick sewer but not well, the other portions? I guess anything's possible, but we're proposing this essentially all as one project, one facility plan. So the concept we're proposing is it's a package deal. Okay. And I, I'm fairly confident that's the way it would proceed. Okay, because I know that you had mentioned that there was a limited amount of funds Correct. available, so that's more along the lines of if it's a package deal, then we would. Yeah, it's more about how they assign points to the types of improvements. Than it, and again, the bulk of ours, I mean, even the, the other improvements are replacing aging systems and so I think we'll be fine. I, I don't think breaking it up would, I th maybe the answer is breaking it up, would that make it better? And I don't think we would need to do that. Okay. Okay. And then my second question was about the storage facility. Um, is a plan to build it bigger than the amount of equipment that we have in order to? Just slightly. Just slightly? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Council Member Duran. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I have uh, two questions. First one, I, I ask all the time, um, you're coordinating with MPS, I would assume, on all projects because you know they have a very aggressive water main replacement plan. Anytime we dig, it's beneficial for them to be involved so they can So as, great, great point. And as we do final design, we definitely will, yes. Okay. Um, and then just my second quick question, when will this be brought back to us for final approval? When will we know if you get the... I the, believe the it's going to be in the mid to late summer time frame. Okay. So we should expect to see this again late summer? Yes. Okay. Council Member Gertz. If we um, draw our reserves down, does that have any impact on the vitality of that fund? I look at the finance director for that, for an answer to that question. We, we've done this before with projects, so it's, it's really a question of how comfortable the finance director is, as well as the city council and city manager with how far down you want to draw that reserve. I mean, we can adjust these and keep it higher. We can draw it lower. These are just examples. And then in, in the, in, as it relates to the building that you're planning on building, have you researched other buildings in town that might be for sale that we could probably purchase instead of build new? We just we talked about that. Um, we did not do significant research on that. We we can do that. One one of the benefits of building it where we're proposing is the ability to tie into the existing heating plant for the facility. So if we maximizing the use of the methane gas produced will help reduce the overall heating cost for that facility may not override depending on what's available. We can do some research, though, just to verify there isn't. I think that would be good. And then in terms of the schedule, um, uh, I hear you tell Councilman Duran that we'll see this late summer, but according to your schedule here, you start your final design here in three weeks. So we're really approving the full Monty here because if you're going to start doing the full design, then um then you advertise for bids in august um is that what we're doing tonight is approving this project short of awarding contracts so the next step would really before we can award any bids the next step really would be um i believe when we receive the uh, when the intended use plan is issued and I think about that. There may not be a specific council action required at that point, but there would be some requirement for a loan application. So I'm thinking that that would be the next step, even before awarding any bids. But tonight we're approving for you to design the entire... Um, we, we would that recommend that we proceed with design, but certainly if the council would like to talk about this more, we can do that. So we're, we're approving a $19 million project tonight short of awarding. I, I'm not saying that I'm against these things because, you know, deferred maintenance will cost you in the long run, but just for council's um, information, it is a fairly big step tonight. I, I think uh, Madam Volkers wishes to have a clarification. I, I do, but I think I have it folds into another question for Bob. So I was thinking the council was just adopting the um, the proposal or the plan tonight. You were going to go out and see if you get the loan. At some point, you have to come back to the council because the funding has to be decided, right. rate, special assessments, etc. And at that point, I thought the project could be approved. That gives the council time to consider and to. This is a major thing. Not that it's not critical i'm just saying it's a 19 million dollar decision and i wasn't thinking they were making it tonight no and that wasn't the intent it okay. wasn't the intent to lock into anything the, the there are there are a number of steps the council will have to take there'll be a loan application we would not advertise for bids without the council approving a resolution authorizing an advertisement for bids and so there will be opportunities to address the financing piece of this albeit recognize that even at that point, we're still going to be working off of estimates as opposed to actual bids, right? 
And to some degree, we will be for four years because the brick sewer will be four years. So you are, in a sense, authorizing a fair amount of work, moving to final design, but we won't advertise for bids until we get council authorization to do that. So if we didn't get approval from the, the discounted rate fund, then you know, plan B would be to uh, bond for it and pay a bit of a higher interest rate. And to me, at, at that point, before we uh, jump into the whole thing, maybe we end up having to do phases so in a subsequent year right. we might be able to apply. You know, obviously the, the lining of the brick sewer is the largest portion of that. Maybe you, you do some every year because you have the completion of 2024. So, you know, it's a four to a five year project and instead of awarding the whole thing, maybe maybe you do a stepped approach depending on right. the availability of the uh, short or the uh, uh, lower interest funding. Correct. And then final question, um, when you line the sewers, uh, the existing sewer, um, do you end up shutting areas of town down while that's done and just maybe Give me the Reader's Digest version of, um, um, of the process so, you know, residents would know kind of what they would be expecting to see if there's a short-term um, interruption of their sanitary sewer service or? Absolutely. So manhole, pipe, manhole. We're going to line this pipe. So in this case, most of these pipes are big enough. We're going to have to excavate in the street, remove the manholes, which incidentally most are brick anyway. Um, as they're doing that work, all of the wastewater flow from upstream is pumped with temporary pumps or bypass pumps around the construction site. Mm -hmm. So all of the upstream properties still receive service. However, those properties that are along that segment won't have service temporarily. Now, for smaller pipes, this is generally only a few hours. I'm not exactly sure of the duration that it will take for these larger pipes, but it, it could be, it w I expect it will be longer than just a few hours. I don't think it's going to be days, for example, but you know, certainly. And is, um, uh, can it be done throughout all four seasons, or are we talking, you know, summer and fall only? I'm not sure they would do it in the dead of winter, but, you know, for example, 30 below, I'm sure they're not going to do it. But I think they can do it pretty much year-round. There are benefits to doing it late fall, early winter, in that that is the time the collection system is least susceptible to being influenced by higher flows from rain events, for example. And so there, the bypass pumping is, is not as rigorous. So I would not be a bit surprised that we see interest in doing it during that time frame, late fall, early winter. Okay, I appreciate you being patient with my questions. And, um, but I would certainly encourage to do some research on yeah. alternative facilities that might uh, be available that uh, could be more cost effective. And, you know, just the timing of the discounted loan rate, what to me would be important because it costs money and uh, it, it, our rate payers will end up um, having increases every year. So one thing we'll need to check on in conjunction with that, we'll go through that exercise. I'm not sure what all the loan funding, you know, for example, buying a commercial building off-site, if that would be eligible for that loan funding or not. So it just may be a little more detailed exercise than one might think to begin with, but absolutely happy to do it. So how, how many square feet of a building are you uh, planning on building for that uh, million? So what's proposed is 100 feet by 99 feet. Why 99 feet? If you have 10,000 feet, you trigger a whole new type of review under the state's sustainable building system requirements that adds cost to the facility. So 10,000 square feet. 
Okay, so yeah, roughly a uh, hundred and thirty dollars a square foot. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Dr. Zimmerman? Pursuant to other rules, uh, is there anyone here in the audience that would like to speak uh, on this public hearing? And I'll repeat, is there anyone here in the audience that wishes to speak regarding this public hearing? Okay, seeing none, can I get a motion to close the public hearing? A uh, motion moved by Councilperson Hendrickson, seconded by uh, Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. So, Madam Volkers, as far as the resolution then, uh, should this be? Okay, okay, all right. So is there a motion to <clears throat> approve the resolution to adopt the facility plan? Motion moved by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Duran. All in favor, uh, please. Sorry. Council Member Gertz. So we're just adopting the plan. We're not authorizing proceeding with anything mm -hmm. else? Correct. That's how I'm reading That's the correct. resolution, just to adopt the plan only. Okay. Thank you. So I second it by Council Member Durand. I'm sorry. Council Member Hendrickson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just, Bob, um, I'm from northern Minnesota, so I'm kind of slow. But um, so if we adopt it, there's zero money except for the work you're going to. Correct. Okay. I, I would just say that separate from your consideration of that resolution, we do have funds available in, the, in our annual budget to proceed with design and under the criteria for our master services agreement, Chris can sign task orders with consultants to begin design without further council action. I just, I just need to clarify. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other further questions for Dr. Zimmerman before we proceed with the vote? Hmm. Uh, do I need to repeat the motion and second? Are we good on that? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Uh -huh. I think we proceed to agenda item number 11, which is to consider resolutions for 8th Street and 13th Avenue North street improvements. Mr. Mayor, I think Councilmember Gertz might have something on a question on this item. Absolutely, Councilmember Gertz. Okay, so I'm, again, I'm not not opposed to. Uh, I, I asked for motions 11 and 12 to be taken off. Uh, again, more of an informational item for the uh, rest of the council here. Um, you had a, uh, a hearing or a public hearing for both of these projects um the council packet says there are about 60 people that showed up and you know just was there feedback and I, I know that there's always been feedback on sidewalk extensions and connections and there's uh, uh we have a policy of uh, how people can uh, uh address that and I, it's in the communication so i appreciate that and so whenever we're um, uh, we're doing we're adopting stuff like this and we're assessing 20% of the project, 80% goes on the the debt levy. So um, I mean we're you know several hundred thousand dollars that we're approving tonight to be added to the debt levy. So in the fall when we start our budget for 2020, we'll have already approve this increase in the debt levy as we go and that was the only reason for taking both items off I'm not opposed to the to items I just want to make that clear that as we uh, approve this stuff we, we got to keep in mind that it impacts our tax situation next year 
So I don't know if you want to add any more to that, Tom, but. Yeah, I, I can. So I'm not sure if you saw, I did, I tried to respond to some of that earlier today. I don't know if you if you had a chance to, if that got forwarded on. Uh, yeah, so that the meeting that we held in January was actually, it was a newer process for us. Normally we just rely on the public hearing that's held that uh, per statutes we have to do prior to awarding the bid. And that's kind of when all the project is sprung on the public and we sometimes get complaints about that. And partly because of this new sidewalk policy and partly to try to be more responsive to the public and get them involved earlier, we decided we'd try an informational meeting earlier on while we were still finalizing the design for the project and give people a chance to see what we're proposing and to provide some feedback on it. And what we did was we did it for all of our CIP uh, rehab projects. So we're, we're trying to bundle four different projects. Um, so back in December, we had the five-year capital improvement plan update and we had there's four primary areas we're talking about. The Oakport Streets area, which the council uh, uh, considered that back in, it was the second meeting in January, the 28th, I think. And then the, there's uh, this 8th Street and 13th Avenue North project, and uh, this Bellsley East area, which we're considering tonight. And then at the next council agenda, we're hoping to bring the Center Square 20th Avenue South area. So that's just south of Concordia where they've got the football field. It's, it's those houses in that area. So we had those four areas at this meeting and we weren't sure what to get because there's times we send out assessment notices to thousands of people and get a half a dozen to show up. So we were actually very impressed by the number that came and it's encouraging to us and so we're, you know, we're definitely planning on doing this in the future too. Out of that, a lot, maybe almost half of them, I think were from the Oakport area. Uh, and I think, you know, this is kind of a newer process for them. They haven't seen uh, us doing CIP projects before, so that might be one of the reasons we got as many. Um, but yeah, there was, there was uh, quite a few from the Oakport area. The next largest group at that meeting was, I believe, from the Center Square 18th Avenue area. And we didn't actually have a sign-in sheet. That's something else maybe we can do next year as well. So this is more based on the feedback we received. And after we did our presentation, we had boards for the four projects in different parts of the room. And by far the two busiest boards were Oakport and the Center Square 20th Avenue area. Uh, we had a few people that asked questions about A Street and 13th Avenue North. And mostly what we were getting there was construction related impacts. Uh, I, I recall there was a person that operates a daycare that's kind of in the middle of the block and she was concerned about how people would get in and out and we talked about how we can try to phase construction to minimize some of those impacts. Mainly we talked about that you know, we put out door hangers to notify people and give them contacts and so that any questions they have as construction gets going, they have a number to call of someone who can come and meet with them and explain what's going on and it, it, you know, just so we can keep people well informed. And as long as we're doing that, they should be able to have access most of the time and if there's times when we'd be cutting that access back, we'll provide them some advance notice. So that was the main questions we had really on 8th and 13th was, was some of that. The center square area, uh, there were definitely people that were very concerned about us trying to fit sidewalks in. And if you're familiar with that area, a couple of the streets there, the right of way is only 40 feet wide. So they've got 20 to 24 foot wide streets. But if you try to put sidewalks in, it, probably means taking out whatever trees are present. Uh, I mean, it, it's very difficult to squeeze it in per the policy we're proposing it. We were not surprised at all by the feedback that we were getting that people were probably going to oppose the sidewalk. And so we sent the letters out and that's per the policy. So we sent letters out to each of these areas that are gonna get sidewalks. 
and we're getting the feedback and per the policy if 75 percent of the people that are on a block say we don't want the sidewalk to go in then we'll drop it from the project and it doesn't require any council action to do that that's just the way the policy will work <coughs> and so it's our way of trying to fill in some of these areas in town that don't have sidewalks or have incomplete sidewalks and uh, so I and I think you know, another reason Center Square 18th Avenue there's really no sidewalks on some of those streets some of them have sidewalks the north-south and they're relatively uh, I think they were there for the entire block so uh, there's some connectivity but there are a few gaps that we're trying to address with the 8th Street and 13th Avenue North projects uh, there there was some areas where sidewalk was most of the way down the street and then the last two houses it isn't there and so we're fairly confident that in those neighborhoods the people are accustomed to the sidewalks and we'll probably end up having those stay in the project so but yeah that was that was what a lot of the feedback was I had another um, yeah. question, but it slipped my mind here. So yeah. if there's somebody else that's got yeah. it, to well, I, and I do. One of the other questions that you had raised, so that, uh, regarding the financing and how it affects the tax levy, and currently in the city of Moorhead, the median value home is approximately one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and every million dollars that we bond for would add about $65,000 to the tax levy for us to make the payments on the bonds. And that's the million dollars of city share, okay? So if we, and as it turns out, these two projects that we're looking at tonight, the city share currently estimated would require about a million dollars. So basically, that would mean the tax levy would have to go up $65,000 to make those payments on the bond. And what that means to a median value home, every $100,000 increase is $5. So this, was, this would be about a $65,000 increase. So the property taxes would go up, I believe for the 8th Street and 13th Avenue North, it was $1.90 <coughs> per year. And the, uh, the Bellsley East area would, would raise on a median value home would raise the taxes a dollar forty so all total the two projects it's about three dollars and thirty cents that we'd be committing to at this time uh, the uh, uh, one thing that I was going to point out is I looked through my emails I didn't see any communication from you so if you yeah. could forward that to the council so they yep. have some of that um, some of that response I'd appreciate that yeah thank you we will do that so. Any questions for Mr. To Trowbridge? Yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you, sir, for the information. Yep. Thank, thank you, you Councilmember Gertz, for bringing that to our attention, for sure. Hey, Councilmember Gertz, that also addresses your questions for 11 and 12. Okay. So then, with that being said, uh, since it's off consent, do we need to have a motion to approve the resolutions for such? Mr. Shockley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Since it's off consent, yeah, you need a motion and a second to approve the resolutions. You can take both items A and B of 11 in one motion. And then you'd have to go to item 12, and you can take that as A and B can be taken together as a single motion. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Shockley. I would so, move approval of uh, 11 A and B um, on the I'd second. The motion has been made by Councilmember Gertz, a second by uh, Councilmember Watson Curry. All in favor of the motion, please approve by signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then, regarding item number 12, A and B, is there a motion to approve those resolutions? So motion moved by Councilmember Hendrickson, second by Councilmember Dahlquist, all in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. I believe we move down to, is 18 off? No, it was 
just a new handout. Just a new handout, okay. Number 19, council reports. Uh, for the uh, public housing, um, they still need an appointment. And uh, they uh, got a bid openings for the elevator last Friday, and I believe they are closing on the loan um, for both the Sharp View elevator and the Riverview Heights elevators. And they are currently um, waiting for the physical needs assessments from four companies. And. Um, and they're watching for the government shutdown. They were scared last time, but before we got to the meeting, they had um, opened up again. <laughs> and so they're still concerned that they might shut down again because they're affected by HUD. So, and that was it for the meeting. Thank you, Council Member Dahlquist. Uh, any other Council Members? Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank uh, Steve Moore and the Public Works Department for the fine work they did clearing the roads. In the last two weeks, we got wobbled by two blizzards, and uh, it gives me and hopefully the residents peace of mind knowing that the roads are going to get plowed. And I know there's snow hills out, but, um, you know, it was two nasty storms, so good work. I second that also, Councilmember Hendrickson. Councilmember Duran. Yep, I just have one from MPS. At our last meeting, uh, Chris Knutson, Water Division Manager, was uh, presented a big change that will be occurring with the water filtration system. Um, they are replacing <laughs> their, and I had to write all this down so I would make sure I got it correct. Their 24 inches of anthracite media, which is a filtration mechanism, um, with 24 inches of granular activated carbon, which is supposed to improve quality. Um, it will add pr additional protection from pathogens and, and particles. And that project will happen between April and September, and there should be no disruption to service. So. It was interesting when it was presented. I just, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> speak it as eloquently as Chris does. <laughs> Thank you for that update and report, Council Member Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to again remind you, Mr. Mayor, and the rest of the City Council of the open house at the library uh, this Wednesday at 5 p.m. Again, this is our opportunity to get our photo taken for the Moorhead Reads uh, marketing campaign that the library is going to do and I'm modeling the shirt that you can purchase at the library for $12 and for members of the audience I'll use yours as an example I also have bookmarks for everyone who attends tonight for everyone um, also it is Black History Month and every Wednesday at the library is going to be a free film um, 6 30 p.m. and it's free and they offer popcorn too so, that's it. Thank you for the update. Uh, just so everyone is aware, I will be in St. Paul on Wednesday, so unfortunately I will have to mm -hmm. miss the open house. So I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> I would imagine that they would make a special um, time available to you to, to get your picture taken for the posters, however. Absolutely. I will show up for that. But not on Wednesday. <laughs> but I will. Council Member Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I didn't have any formal meetings to attend, but I did attend the um, open house project for the Metro Grow, which is the 2045 um, uh, uh, input planning um, through MetroCog. Uh, there is a survey, survey still available online th um, through the Metro. Metropolitan Council of Government. So if you type in metrogrow.org and scroll to the bottom, there's still um, a survey available. And 
Was someone else going to highlight this input too? Um, this was rescheduled due to weather also. Um, so I wanted to remind folks the um, U.S. Um, Highway 10 and 75 corridor study uh, was rescheduled due to extreme cold weather. So they were not sending out postcards again. So it is scheduled tomorrow, Tuesday the 12th from 4.30 to 6.30. And it's in the um, commons of the high school. And I believe... Um, I believe there's a presentation, is it 445? It doesn't say on this page. Open house during that time, but there is a formal presentation, I believe. Um, okay. And then I just wanted to thank uh, uh, the Red River Market hosted their first winter market at the Yemkomst on Saturday, and they had estimated um, close to 3,000 people in attendance. So that was, that was a really cool opportunity and um, have vendors in all floors and um, could get a cup of coffee right next to the ship. So it was a really uh, unique opportunity. I just wanted to thank them for hopping across the river. And that's the end of my report. Thank you very much. Any other reports? I guess I'll give a, a brief report, and I think, uh, Madam Volkers, you'll be talking about the legislative action day. Well, we can kind of tag team it if that's okay. Uh, I've been kind of a whirlwind uh, last few weeks, so I'll be uh, succinct. Uh, I had the pleasure uh, with other council members uh, to go down to Legislative Action Day uh, in St. Paul. Uh, we did meet with our legislators locally here, uh, Representative Lean, uh, Representative Mark Hart, and Senator uh, Eakin. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's been one of those days. Right. Uh, and so uh, they are uh, actively uh, going uh, and uh, ch charging forward to do what they can uh, to uh, address legis or sorry, local government aid and a few other uh, things that are of interest to our uh, city and very important. I want to commend also uh, City Manager uh, Volkers, um, as, well as, as well as Lisa Bodie uh, and, um, and uh, Scott Hutchins, thank you very much uh, for their work. Uh, they're doing a lot of good things uh, for us in our city. Uh, and so it was a very productive uh, uh, day. Uh, Governor Waltz was there in attendance, also spoke very highly about uh, his efforts to uh, fund better LGA, local government aid. So I thought that was uh, a really productive uh, day. Uh, I was clicking here to make sure I don't miss anything. I uh, did have also lunch with President Kraft uh, at uh, Concordia College uh, last Friday. It was a very also productive meeting. Concordia uh, is doing good work also in our community, also uh, looking at <clears throat> ways to coordinate and collaborate with uh, Concordia and all of our universities here in town uh, for efforts to promote a lot of uh, big, big ideas. Uh, I'll leave it at that uh, in hopes that we can uh, work together and improving our relationships. Uh, also, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, this past week uh, with the uh, Fargo-Moorhead Diversion uh, Authority. I was there for a couple days. Uh, we had a chance to uh, meet with legislators from North Dakota and Minnesota uh, regarding the project. Uh, I guess uh, no news is good news. So we're, we're moving forward with that, uh, and uh, I think we'll be some follow-up with the commission here, I would assume, by the end of the week. Uh, and so at this point, we're meeting weekly regarding uh, that topic as well. Uh, I think for city, that might be all that I have. Unless anyone has, unless I'm missing something that somebody might have saw me at and I'm not <laughs> remembering. Oh, yes. I did go down to St. Paul uh, yesterday uh, to uh, speak at uh, Senator Klobuchar's uh, presidential announcement as well. Uh, was called about that on Friday, showed up on Sunday. Uh, it was a good event. Uh, tried to do my best to promote uh, the city at the event. Uh, and it was... Uh, on all good experience. I don't think I've ever spoken in front of that many people before, so hopefully I don't embarrass the city, you all in any way. But uh, 
that was a good experience. Otherwise, I think that might be it for me. I'll pass it on to Adam Volkers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to give a brief update on the city prosecutor office, what's going on. Um, tomorrow we're, we have our sixth meeting, six, with all the other Clay County cities as we're planning and discussing um, the prosecution services and setting up the offices and handling the cases. And we've got a really good um, group going there that we've met six times to set this up or to talk and to communicate. So we're really appreciative for everybody's, all the other cities in Clay County and their partnership on that. Um, all the staff began work the week of either um, January 28th, well, that week, January 28th. Um, we have attorney Steve Beadlesbacher, um, paralegal Aaron Fields. She started and he started Monday, January 28th. <coughs> Then attorney Alex Stock and legal assistant victim witness specialist um, Lacey Johnson started January 30th. So all the staff are in place. Then they began prosecution services on that Friday, um, February 1st. So far they've had um, daily court hearings to include like arraignments, um, lockups or in custody appearances, court trials tra on the traffic exp um, offenses, misdemeanor pretrial hearings, omnibus waiver hearings, rural eight hearings, um, and contested hearings. All jury trials set so far have been resolved, so that's good. They are busy. The office continues to work with the IT and obtaining all the softwares that are necessary. Our um, IT department has been great and they want to um, me to offer a shout out to our IT department because it's all new for everybody, this software that is needed to manage all these cases. Um, we don't have all the information, everything's not hooked up yet. So. Um, um, in the interim, Aaron and Lacey have been reaching out to the police department to obtain the um, case information to even get the cases um, in, entered into the system. We don't have any information, so that's kind of hard. We don't have the ICR numbers. We don't have anything on these cases that are coming through. However, the good news is everything's paperless in that office. They're completely paperless. They might be the first department in our city to be paperless completely. So that's great. You walk in there, there's no paper. So um, they're doing great. And then the last thing is about that office. They've met personally with every single um, police department, city police department in Clay County that we're servicing. And um, they've been helpful in setting up the parameters and sentencing guidelines and having those discussions with the chiefs and the police officers. And those discussions hadn't been held in the past. So um, about the, how to handle the cases. So everything's flowing really well. I have a meeting tomorrow with them. I'm going to break the news to them about the cost of all this. So um, I will break the news to you after I total everything. So that will be next meeting. So, and I say break the news on purpose. So anyway, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Volkers. Uh, any other uh, comments, reports from council members? And I believe Item number 21, we will move into executive closed session. Is there a motion to move to go into executive closed session? Second. Uh, motion is Councilmember Gertz. Uh, I have a conflict of interest on item number B, so I'll attend the executive session for item number A and then leave uh, the executive session. Thank you for that clarification. Councilmember Gertz, uh, so uh, Councilmember Carlson has made the motion, seconded by Councilmember White. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same time. Executive session, we go.
Uh, we're back to the executive session. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting this evening? So moved. I've got a motion by Councilmember Carlson. Council member, second by Council member Durand. I don't have a quorum. <laughs> Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. Good night, everyone.